Senator Shelby. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As I said at the outset, uh, I'm concerned, and I think I'm joined by a lot of others in the Senate and the House, about the impact inflation is having for, on the Army and the Navy and everything else, and I'm sure you are too. At 8.5%, the current rate of inflation is undoubtedly impacting the approximately 1 million total force soldiers and their families, among other things. Uh, I'm also concerned that inflation will reduce the Army's buying power, as you know, realize, as your own modernization priorities shift from research and development into procurement. Did you, Madam Secretary, did you fully account for all foreseeable inflationary pressures in putting this request together? Because this request is going nowhere in the Senate or the House, as you know, the whole defense request is, is uh, looks ludicrous to probably the majority of the House and the Senate. Uh, Vice Chairman, I think the department and certainly the Army inside the department tried to account for inflation as best we could when we were developing the budget and finalizing the budget. So, for example, in addition to an overall you know, $30 billion a year increase for the department's request, the department added $20 billion a year to try to address uh, rising inflation. But that was before Russia went into Ukraine, sure. causing energy prices to spike. But I am concerned. And, and before the latest numbers on inflation, too. You know, they're just coming up. Yes, and I was just going to say, I am concerned, given where inflation sure. is now, about our purchasing power. We, we see it, for example, in our Milcon projects, where construction costs are rising significantly. Um. The munition, munitions industrial base, you know, uh, as we, you know, Russia's unprovoked war in Ukraine has made some of the Army's capabilities in the household names, like the Javelin, the Stinger, and so forth. The U.S. provides, uh, as the U.S. provides billions of dollars, and we're going to do more uh, military aid, we're realizing just how finite our munition stocks are and how fra fragile, to some extent, our industrial base. Uh, could you update us on the efforts by you and others with the Army and uh, how you're going to accelerate the procurement process here? Certainly, uh, Vice Chairman. You know, we are concerned about the industrial base, and we are working closely with defense industry to try to make sure that they're going to be able to ramp up production. So uh, specifically, for example, with Javelin, I think the CEO of Lockheed announced just in the last day or two that they're working hard to double production uh, in the near term on javelins. We, when I talk to CEOs, you know, I, one of the things that I raise typically first are the supply chain issues and you know, how can we work together to shore some of that up. And it's something I think we're just going to have to continue to work on. I think uh, the department, as part of the supplemental request, has asked for some additional authorities that will I think better position the department going forward to build up our munition stocks. And specifically, I would say the Army has substantially increased its investment in ammunition because we recognize the importance of having adequate munition stockpiles. In the area of hypersonics, uh, General, I'll address this to you. Uh, we're all pleased to learn that the Army will field its first hypersonic battery uh, in 2023. But we all, all are concerned, and have been a long time, about the progress that China and Russia have made in this area. Have they surpassed us? Are we on par with them? We, we've got to win that war. Senator, you make a very good point, and, and that's why we've been aggressively uh, going off after hypersonics uh, in the Army. We're very pleased with our progress uh, so far. We have a battery at uh, Joint Base lewis McCord right now. And we're doing the final testing, and we expect to have that uh, operationally in um, 2023, as you said, sir. Talk to me a little bit, uh, General, about recruitment. Uh, you know, we have an all-volunteer service, mm -hmm. and it gets tough in recruitment. Uh, as you plan to reduce or modernize some of your soldiers, you still got to recruit all the time. Yes, Senator. Uh, what, what is the biggest challenge here? Is it... Uh, uh, lack of interest? Is it lack of uh, uh, something? 
Well, Sen, I think we're in a war for talent. I think um, you know one of the uh, factoids that the the secretary, talk, secretary talked about, 23 percent of Americans are, are qualified to come to the Army. But an interesting factor that I've seen is 83 percent of young men and women that are coming into the Army come from a military family. So we're becoming a military family business. I have three kids and a son-in-law that serve. And I think we need to, you know, get more exposure and show the advantages and the pathways to success to other young men and women so it becomes a American family business and there's a call to service. Uh, Madam Secretary, one last question. Uh, dealing with the Army Futures Command. Uh, it was established as a four-star command about four years ago to accelerate your modernization efforts. That's what we were told. As you prepare to put many of these efforts into the, you know, modernization in place, uh, you haven't, to my knowledge, nominated a new commander since General Murray's retirement in. This slide is open. Is that still true? We are working with the White House to put forward a nominee for Army Futures Command. We intend to keep that as a four-star command. Uh, you know, I think there's been some speculation that we're thinking about downgrading AFC, and that's not the case. If you don't have a commander in place of a futures command, you, 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 you have no leadership, right? Well, we have a very capable acting commanding general, a uh, lieutenant general, but Jim he's Richardson. Still acting. Yes, we, we want to get that nominee sure. over to the Senate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.